Possibly. It was really great. Very fun. little mistake. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a nice part of it because uh, I want I want to make this point. There was a, a, a common desire, burning desire, on the part of a, a certain Ferris in my gallery had a, a commitment to do something about the paucity of really good artwork here, uh, encouraging the better people we had, and they were starting to surface, uh, getting collectors to buy their work, uh, bringing more important art in from the East in the form of individual shows or individual works that could simply be sold to the uh, oh, two dozen or so Hollywood-based uh, producers and actors who were collecting painting. We saw a potential and the Los Angeles so large and so vibrant and with the entertainment industry in Hollywood didn't make, didn't make any sense to have uh, to not have a bona fide functional uh, art world in, in, in the sense in which I describe it. Mm -hmm. we, that's what we wanted so we were not competitors we were uh, boatsmen we were at the oars in the same little pea green boat well, I think that, that's yeah. something I want to pick up. But first, I want to sh oh. where we have photos. Oh, nice. This is uh, Ferris. Yes, you can tell me maybe a little bit. That's you, Patty. Yes, that's Patty. and it's me, and that's uh, Craig, 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 Craig and, and this is that girl everybody slept with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's important. Yeah. Do we don't remember her name. Don't yeah. remember her name. Maggie. That's your gallery, is it? Yeah. Maggie, I think her name was. Maybe you did it, Henry. Uh, it looks like uh, Hassel Smith. Hassel Smith, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. So anyway, that's what, that was the driver, and that's, that was the, uh, quite a different climate than you would have seen in New York in those days, because we, we had two sticks to rub together to make some sparks so something would happen. Neither one of us could do it alone. So we just did it together, right? Well, let's add, I'm not sorry, but let's uh, fill out that thing a little bit. When did Virginia Duan open her gallery? Oh, not till later, not till yes. after, about the time that Everett left. Yeah, yeah, but 60 or 61. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got my gallery, I was a high yeah. gallery. But, the, but, uh, but again, I think Virginia fits in, and she's not here today, but she fits into this thing of bringing two things. One, having something to do with Los Angeles artists. Of course, Ferris had a great deal to do with that. You had a certain amount to do with that. But mainly bringing art of national contemporary quality right. to Los Angeles. They were all educators. They, that, and that's the difference between the art market and the art market Well, she, yeah. she was well suited to, uh, yeah. it was good that she came because she got right in step and, and made her contribution. Right. And she had the means to do to it. Do it. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, uh, uh, oh, she had these uh, connections. Uh, uh, was it the Demoniel young lady worked with her for a while? One of the daughters. Yeah. Yeah. She, you know, she was connected internationally in a way that none of us was. Yeah, right. she, it was a w wonderful time yeah. that that she came, uh, and just at the right time when we needed another little jump start. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Now, ever you said that you were all in it together, but. I think you first, the gallery, your second gallery, when you were coming back from French and Company, and then Virginia Duan's gallery, I mean, that must have been very threatening to, to a struggling outfit like financially, like Ferris. Well, uh, Virginia was enormously threatening to me in that she could pick off anybody I showed or anybody I was interested in simply by offering them more money. And she did that once or twice, and I saw the handwriting on the wall, and I thought, I remember thinking that um, this isn't going to end well. And just as I thought this isn't going to end well for me, uh, she decided to go to New York. Mm -hmm. But who did, and who did, who did she uh, uh, pick off? Well, uh, I was talking to Ad Reinhardt, mm -hmm. and she offered him much significantly more than, than I could offer him. She showed Ad, and then there were people I was interested in, uh, to add to the people I already represented, that she got to more quickly and with more money. But she had Rauschen, she had Rauschen, she had Rauschen, she had Eve Klein. Who eventually I would show, and did show when uh, she left. That's right, and well, Eve Klein. Eve Klein. And, and yeah. Franz Klein, and 
Franz Kong. And Philip Gustin. That's right. And a lot of first generation. Yeah, pretty yeah. Uh, major, she had, and she, major work. She, she, didn't, work it didn't, she didn't have, uh, harm me in the slightest because I was smart enough to bring only the people I had already gotten to know at Marlboro at French and Company. And I brought people who I thought were quite loyal to me. Uh, and that nobody that I showed was somebody that I thought she, she didn't have to go there. She had a no. lot of choices, but I never ran into that with her because I was working with uh, different galleries and different... And she had no design of what you were doing. No, no. Yeah. not really. Yeah. Were you, why don't we pick up from there, were you, you had your first gallery, which from what I understand mostly showed local, whether it was Bay Area yeah. or... Correct. And then you go to New you take us to going to New well, York and then coming right. back. It's very simple. Uh, I was had my gallery for about a year. I got tired of reading about the abstract expressionists in art news. I wanted to go to New York and take a look myself. What was the energy? What did the work look like? What did the artists look like? What did the, what did the Cedar Cafe look like? I just went to New York. A uh, cold turkey, you know, no advance letters, nothing. And I, it was rather quiet there, and I just made the rounds of the dealers I had respected, and I was able to see each one without a prior appointment. I mean, it, they, they were available. Were, they were very available. So I, I spent a half a day with Leo Castelli, and a day with Sidney Janis, and uh, Sam, uh, Sam Coots, mm -hmm. a lot, met all these people. And they were curious, they were all curious to find out what was going on in Los Angeles, because things were a little slow in New York. And they were all thinking, why don't we have, why don't we do business in Los Angeles? Yeah. So because I was from there, they gave me the time of day. And Sam Coots is the one who took me Everybody off. saw it. It didn't turn up, but everyone saw LA as the place of it new money, right? The potential of new money. And, and I was not right. about to dispel the dream. Because, yeah, a, a completely fallacious thought. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, an old Hollywood person, something thinks... I mean, that was a, as, as, a, as an L.A. dealer, that, that was a fire you continued to fan. Yeah, right. Uh, right. True, true or untrue? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Large, <laughs> largely untrue. Everything, <laughs> looked flam everything looked flammable here. You know? That's right. That's so, right. so, so anyway, I, did, I just parlayed that, see? And Sam Coots tipped me off on the opening of French & Company because it was known on the street that their uh, director left under strange circumstances. There was nobody running the gallery, and Clement Greenberg didn't want to be even seen in, in it because he didn't want to be called an art dealer. Right. So he said, go over to French and Company. You seem like a, a, a bright and ambitious person. Maybe there's something for you. So I went over to French and Company, just walked in, and asked to see the president of the company. I got the name from Sam Coots, and the secretary came down and brought me up. And I sit down with uh, Spencer Samuels, and uh, I talked to him a bit, and he said, what's your gallery like, and a few things like that, and he was getting very cozy, and he asked me if I might have any interest in uh, coming there. And I thought this was a joke, I mean, me? I mean, I'm just a neophyte in Los Angeles, and here's this big-time gallery that was the toast of New York in the sense that it was the most watched gallery at the time. And at the end of uh, a conversation lasting about an hour, he said, there's somebody I want you to see, if you will. I said, sure. And he picked up the phone and he called Clem Greenberg. And he said, I must send this young man over to talk to you. We used to receive him. So then he says, you're going over to see Clem Greenberg. So I went over in a cab and I spent about the rest of the day there, three hours or so. A few drinks, I hope. Yeah, he has okay. quite a few drinks. And For sure. A very interesting conversation. He was very interested to find out what my eye was. Everything, Clem uh, was big on eye, you know, and uh, he would say, you have the eye, you don't have the eye. And uh, near the end, he looked at me and he nodded and he said, Evan, don't worry about you, you've got the eye. And he picks up the phone and called uh, Spencer Samuels and said, the kid will do. And the, next, <laughs> the next morning, I had an offer to come there. So I'm dying on Santa Monica Boulevard, I got this huge building, and here I can go and, and run a French company. So I, I hesitated all of about five minutes and said I'll come, but I have to, I have to in an orderly way, got to place some artists, I got to get rid of the lease. 
and uh, that happened rather quickly because I was able to lease that huge building. I think that building was about 8,000 square feet. I think it was 100 by 100 feet. It was a huge Just building. I brought you some pictures too, I'll show you later. It was a very big, it looked like a, a, a high school a basketball court, you know. So that's, that's how I, I got to uh, French Academy. Hmm. Now, Just to pick up on the, this, the eye, which people don't talk about very much. I mean, there's a, there's a story I've heard that Greenberg's asked people, who's the greatest living American? And I said, who would he say? Well, Ted Williams, of course. And I said, why? And he said, because he can see the laces on the baseball <laughs> as it's spinning. And that's yeah, the yeah, eye. That's but, the but, but that was something that people would talk about at that time. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you've you always talked about it. You yeah, always talked about it. Talk about but, uh, it. but Clem's uh, flaw was uh, that he wasn't generous. That's true. That he had an eye, but without generosity. And uh, I loathed him. I absolutely loathed him. And uh, he didn't loathe me. He didn't know who I was. But he certainly loathed what I represented. You know, he put down Popeye in every opportunity. Right. Uh, he hated uh, Ellsworth. You know, thought he was uh, French and uninteresting and uh, uh, couldn't make head or tail out of Frank Stella. He was very, very committed to a single tributary, and that was Calafino. Beginning, well, with, he didn't yeah, beginning with Morris Lewis and Helen Frankenthaler and Jules Zelinsky right. and, and on and on and on, mm -hmm. you know, Larry Burns. And that's who he championed. Ken Nolan. Nolan. That's who he championed. That's who we talked right. about. Later on, when I when I left French and Company because it shut down, I went back and opened a second gallery. I fell out of favor with with Clem. I was a official protege for a period of time there, but he uh, led into me for uh, having an interest in people uh, like John's. Yeah. And when I had yeah. when I, Leo Castelli was nice enough to send me enough work of John's for a, what I call the retrospective because it was oh, a video. Yeah, I remember that show. I show. I found I found, I found, I found the catalog. You can yeah. refresh it's a pity you don't have the work. No, <laughs> no, no, I have the aggravation, but I don't have the work. <laughs> Clem, Clem just, uh, he didn't like my choices. And I said, well, I, I just uh, not willing to uh, say that the only art we're looking at is, is color field when you've got people like this around. And if you mark my words, uh, Rauschenberg and, and Johns are, are, are major figures, and uh, I don't say we were enemies, but he certainly uh, didn't pay any attention to me. Well, I, I must I must also say that uh, uh, there was a uh, a lady called Ginny Wright who worked for Sidney Jones, rich and around right, and uh, lived in Seattle, and she started a foundation in Seattle called the Blow Dell. Foundation, Bo Dell was a maiden name. He's a big timber man in Washington State and North into Canada. And she met with two other people once a year. Um, and they would talk about acquiring a sculpture and putting it somewhere in the city of Seattle. And the two people she met with were Clem and Gifford Phillips. And they decided on. Uh, unanimously on, uh, on what it was they were going to buy. And while Clem was there, he just spewed his poison. And I remember Ginny was, she began as a kind of a client of mine. I met her, uh, not when she was at Sydney's, but, but, but shortly after. And I remember selling her a great, great, great painting of Roy's called Drowning Girl. Mm -hmm. And Clem couldn't bear the painting and spoke so bitterly against him that she gave it to the Museum of Modern Art. She just got it out of her house. Just to kind of, she told me to quiet Clem. Well, the big trouble with Clem, you, you were talking about personality flaws. He, yeah. He was always, no one really knew, just like you said, yeah. whether he was an art dealer, whether it was, you know, Morris Lewis was dead, he would hang his, he would, uh, he would reshape his tent. He would restretch the canvas. He'd repaint, repaint David Smith's? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess he did. Unpaint. Unpaint. He did. Un, unpaint. Not repaint. Un, unpaint. He, he took all the paint. He would strip the paint. Yeah. Yes. The paint off the yeah. So, That's called chutzpah. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. I think that was an artist's one that name. Or what I, was I think chutzpah is defined as being a kind of artist. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
one of the most horrific experiences I had as a young dealer was at French and Company. And it was one of those times when Morris Lewis brings up a batch of paintings, like right. three months' work, all rolled up like carpets, yeah. and nothing stretched. Out. And he's laid down, and he and uh, uh, Bill Rubin and Morris, who was a quiet man, and they're deciding where the edge was. And, uh, and I said, uh, Morris, they're, they're stretching the paint. And he said, I said, what about the edge? I mean, what about the field? Yeah, what, what about the proportions? Morris, these are your canvases. Yeah. What about your point of view? <laughs> Say something. Yeah. And Morris sits there, and, and I'll be damned. Uh, Clem stretches about 20 major works. They decide what constitutes yeah. a painting. I mean, there's a lot. The other time was out there mowing down. I mean, right. Yeah. Now, I'm <laughs> telling you, there are a lot of scraps on the floor. I wish I had them all. Right. Uh, but uh, that's what he did. And uh, yeah. to me, I was horrified that someone in his position would presume to do this for, uh, for, to an artist. Uh, I mean, that, uh, that, was, that was really shocking. Let, let me that, that another question. This is at that time, but you're talking about getting out here. Irving is getting out here. You're starting the galleries. You're working in the galleries. Uh, do you mind talking just a little bit about what backing you had? Where both, both of you? Yeah. Bit? Well, this is a question I'd like to uh, like to ask tonight also, which yeah. is that each of you started the business here. You know, the business model that you developed. Part of which, of course, is as Henry's talking about is the backing. Right. And then what you would have considered success. Because I think in each case that's a little bit different. In, in each case, it, it, is, it, it is a little Why don't you start, Irving, the, the business model that developed once you started it? Well, well the business model wasn't so mysterious. Uh, we needed uh, really small sums of money. In, in, in order to get going. But your rent was $250 a month. It's something like that, yeah, 200 but, but let's start, I mean, the, okay. the model that Walter and Ed Keenholz had developed was well, absolutely on was, the board. was completely chaotic, completely chaotic, and I knew I had to do, I had to do something counter to what it was they had done. And um, in this order, the first thing I decided we had to do was reduce the number of people to a manageable size, down from 80 to 12 or 15, which was really hard to do. That was maybe the toughest thing that, that, that I had to do. But beyond that, I wanted uh, an acceptable space. A space, you know, I worked for Lowell, I was very involved with uh, international style. And describe, I mean, the, the original Ferris was behind Streeter Blair's Behind furniture. Streeter Blair's little uh, furniture shop. and. Uh, uh, it had more corners than I could, I could think to tell you about, you know. Everywhere you looked, there was a, a, another place to turn. You angry. should have asked me, I would have rented you half my space and we both uh, have <laughs> Would have been fabulous. <laughs> would have been fabulous. I should have done that. But in any case, I knew we couldn't stay there. I knew we had to kind of cut down the number of people. One. Two, uh, couldn't stay there. I had to find a, uh, an acceptable space. Uh, three, get the backing. Somehow, in that order in order to proceed, in order to go forward. Uh, I didn't have a lot of money. I left New York, uh, having worked for Noel for two years with very small sums of money, and I knew I couldn't manage it myself. Walter certainly didn't have any money. So on that front, I sat with Walter and I said, who do you sell to? And he said, uh, not too many people, which t turned out to be an overstatement. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, after uh, hemming and hawing and uh, <laughs> Walter checking this kind of odd list that he had and finding nobody, um, I asked him who came into the gallery. I said, who comes in in a regular way? Anybody? I mean, does anybody come in? Have you, have you talked to anybody that comes in? He said, oh, yeah, he said, the people come in. I said, well, who comes in? He said, well, there's a man called Gilford Phillips whose uncle was Duncan Phillips. Um, they have the, the great collection, the great collection, the great gallery in Washington. And he's uh, incredibly perceptive and uh, fun to talk to. And I, I talked to him, although uh, he hasn't bought anything from us. 
I said, who else? Well, the Vincent Price. He comes in. So I put down Vincent Price's name. Anybody else? Lady called Sadie Moss. Who was she? Well, her husband owned a, a big accounting firm and was enormously successful in Southern California. Husband died. She went to an analyst. Analyst said to her, get an interest. Get an interest. You've got too much time on your hands. I didn't know any of this. I just knew her name. And I wrote, so armed with these three names, I called Gifford, asked if I couldn't see him. And he was accessible. And I went to his house on La Mesa and sat with him and told him what I intended to do. And he said, very interesting. And I said, we're going to need a little help. He said, I tell you what. He said, I won't help you, but I will make you one promise. I like very much what you what you've had to say to me. I will support your gallery by buying work. I'll come in. You can count on me to buy paintings, as many as I, I, I feel I'd like to buy. And uh, as a consequence, give you support in that direction. I said, lovely. I said, that's a, a wonderful commitment. I said, thank you very much. Left. Called Vincent Price. Arranged for him to come into the gallery. He didn't offer to have me go to his house. Uh, he, he came to the gallery, we went off for a cup of coffee, I explained what I was doing, he said, uh, I love the idea, he said, I wish you all the luck in the world, but uh, there's nothing I can do I'm in, between jobs. in your behalf. <laughs> I'm between jobs, right. <laughs> and he had had this experience sort of backing the Beverly Hills Museum that had yeah. lasted only one year. Right, right, and he was, he was burned by the experience of one thing or another. But, but uh, he was very pleasant and affable, and, yeah. and that was that. And then I called Mrs. Moss, and we went out, we had lunch. And she said, interesting, she said, what sort of money are we talking about? And I said, I need somebody to make up my deficit at the end of the year, and I'm not sure what that's going to be. She said, well, give me a number, roughly. I said, can it be 3,000? Can it be six? She said, is that all? I said, as far as I can gauge, I'm taking very little money. There's, there's, the, the rent is negligible. Uh, I'm going to need a little money for startup. I'm going to need a little money to find a space and, and, and do it. But I'll find the right space. And there's not a lot of architecture involved in what I'm going to be doing. And so consequently, um, I can't tell you precisely, but I can give you a, a rough parameter. Maybe seven, maybe eight thousand dollars at the end of the year. She could hardly believe it. You know, she thought it was really negligible. And she said, uh, "Well, we'll do it so long as uh, I can maintain my interest in your doing what you're doing." And so we began. I got some money from her. I found a space across the street on La Cienega, kind of really attractive box which I was able to, there's a tailor in there now, uh, which I was able to rent very, very reasonably and able to kind of paint, fix, and do a couple of uh, partitions. And uh, got it done. And uh, in exchange for giving me this little bit of money that I needed from year to year, uh, I took it to dinner once every month or once every two months, explained what I was doing, and kind of tried to fire her interest. And I was successful in doing that. So she absolutely backed the gallery uh, to the tune of 8,000 thereabouts every year for six years. And at the end of six years, the gallery turned a corner. And I began making a profit. But it took six years until that happened. And without her, without Mrs. Moss, we never could have gone forward. Well. And she didn't really, I mean, she didn't take much work or do anything. No, like she that. didn't take any. She, uh, she took, um, my recollection, she took a, uh, a Ken Price sculpture in all that time. She would come occasionally and sit in the gallery and, and be in there and, and was always very mm. willing to talk to and chat with. She Remember, was, she liked that. She yeah. liked the, the, the involvement yeah, with artists. Liked the she liked the dialogues that well, she was able to have. You want to hear how I got my back? Well, yes. let's, let's tell you uh, two. So we have two galleries in your case. Well, well, the first one, a uh, business model. The first one, uh, I basically funded it. I mean, because I had enough money for left over from William Morris and law practice to get uh, to get started. 
And uh, was Jenny involved in Sabaku Gil Uh Well, uh, when I married her, yeah. Isn't your wife your principal backer? No, no, no. I'm my wife's principal backer. <laughs> who, who, who was your first? Who was your? My, well, my uh, only wife I ever had was Joan Jacobs. Joan Jacobs. Okay. And Joan Jacobs' father, uh, in those days, was president of Technicolor Corporations, uh, because he was in with a crowd of guys that were sort of had uh, control of Technicolor, and he was also a very, very good businessman uh, in selling products to uh, major drug chains. I mean, he's a very affluent guy. And I think shortfalls that I might have had, they were not large, uh, but uh, I got help uh, uh, from her dad, really. This is, during, this is the first gallery? Yeah, the first gallery. Right. Uh, but, uh, uh, but let's uh, stay on because the, there's a huge difference between the first effort, Ellen, yeah, and was the Ferris. Yes. I mean, the first Ferris was maybe, what, a thousand square feet? Yeah, uh, something like that. Like yeah. You, you're opening a 10,000 square foot space. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, because you also you had a restaurant. restaurant. Yeah, I have a restaurant uh, called Chez La Vie. And Chez La Vie. <laughs> Clever, wasn't it? Clever, wasn't it? Uh, Chez, Chez La Vie. Uh, was uh, caught on with my Hollywood friends uh, because the Motion Picture Academy's uh, theater for screenings was really kitty corner. You could see it from the front door of my building. And uh, I, I met a lot of actors uh, in, uh, when I was at House Council at Columbia Pictures. I would write their employment contracts when they would come to work for uh, Columbia Pictures. And I had friendships, good friendships with James Colburn and a lot of people. So uh, those folks came in with friends, and it was a it was a pleasant place. It was a balcony overlooking the gallery with nice uh, stone net chairs and an interesting menu, uh, and it was a you know it brought something uh, it brought something in, uh, and my rent was uh, really not very high for that space because it was uh, not a particularly considered a good block for anything else. There were no stores there yet. Right. Uh, on that block, and there was nothing uh, on Doheny, and Melrose came in. It was a, it was rather tacky looking. And a lot of telephone wires. A lot of telephone wires. <laughs> All <laughs> the So that was uh, that was uh, um, mani manageable and and uh, okay. But uh, when I came back for gallery number two, with big time and uh, ex uh, expectations, and wanting to take advantage of these contacts I now had in New York. Well, with individual artists, but also with dealers. See, now, by this time, Leo Costelli and, and uh, Sydney, people like that, did, and Andre Emmerich, they didn't look upon me as a, as a young kid from California. I was a fellow New York art dealer. I mean, it doesn't take long to get in the bunch, bunch and I could get uh, material from them uh, with, without putting up uh, money up front just on the strength of my ability to sell it in London. And they, of course, weren't such august figures in those days themselves. I mean, Leo... No, that happened, actually, that happened a bit later. later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but then, among, among, among his peers, you know, he had a, he had a real place. But uh, the point that Everett hit, touched on, I think, which is uh, uh, so memorable to me, was that at that time, at the time Everett's talking about, you could go anywhere. You could go to Sidney Janis, get an Alber show, for example, yeah, yeah. he would send me, as he did, an Alber show right. uh, on a signature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same just, just on a signature. He sent me, yeah. he sent yeah. me an art sculpture show. Yeah. He sent me a Dada show. Good stuff. On a signature. Leo didn't require a signature. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, they were very, very generous. Yeah. But I still needed some capital. And uh, uh, there was this young guy, this incipient collector by the name of Frederick Wiseman. And uh, he, was, yeah, he was just starting to think about collecting. In fact, I sold him his first work of art. Was a, it was a lithograph. I think it was a Chagall, if I remember right. But once he saw me coming back uh, from New York with New York content. Did I, did I get to him before you got to him, or did you get to him before I got to him? I don't know. I don't know, because I sold him initially and maybe you can understand it or figure it out, I can't unravel it, uh, a lot of West Coast material. 
Allowed That's what he bought. Allowed what? West Coast material. He bought Urban, Moses, Billy Al Bankston, John no, Altoon I was from before, me. I was before that. Yeah. You I were get, before that. Yeah. yeah. You, he right. was before that. And I, I, don't, yeah. I just right. want to insert that this one right. thing because yeah. it will cover our conversations later. Yeah. Lackwell was in the process of going to build a building. They started this thing called the Contemporary Art Council. Fred Wiseman and Marcia were original members of that. Yes. They were very generous about entertaining their house. They bought very the West Coast Art. It was all in the bedroom and all in the bathroom. Yeah, that's exactly right. right. That's right. Okay. However, I will I just 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 in <laughs> passing. My one story about those classes that Walter gave that's right. at the Wiseman's was sitting there in the living room with a screen and Walter flashing my slides and he flashes a Newman for the first time. Nobody's ever seen one before. Big painting with a zip down the middle. Fred gets up. I was sitting right behind him. I wish I could give you the day. Fred gets up and says, okay kid, he said, you've lost me. <laughs> Walks out of the room into the den, which is across the hall, turns on TV. <laughs> You can hear the television going. That was Fred. But anyway, I needed, I needed somebody who wanted some backroom connections. See, he wanted me to go to New York and find little jewels and get them on consignment and, 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 uh, and then So that he can consider them. Right. Yeah, and, right. and very often buy them. Right. So uh, in order for me to be able to make these trips, see, that now it was getting expensive because I was in New York at least twice a month. Maybe, well, yeah, I have a, uh, my diary. I didn't bring it with me, but I have notes in my diary. I was in New York almost every week, uh, never less than twice a month for that whole time of the second gallery, getting stuff. Anyway, Fred. So we were flying? Yeah, yeah, I was flying. Which was an expensive thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it was a lot of moving around and a lot of deal making, but when it all came down, the amount of money I cleared. Uh, you know, when, with all my expenses, it was hardly worth the effort, but it was exciting and I enjoyed it. And Fred Wiseman uh, put up s some money for me to, to basically to buy an inventory. I mean, it wasn't a gift. It was an inventory with un, uh, not very clear notions about what happens to it if it doesn't sell. Because when I, when I closed gallery number two, I basically gave back to him the inventory that was bought with his I remember. I yeah. remember. But it had gone up, see, uh, in, in value. value. So uh, he, he came out all right for that, you know. In fact, if I had kept that inventory, I would have come out very, very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But let's go back to the, the model that, that Everett's, the, so that the second time, what you really see yourself as doing is bringing who are becoming major artists connected to these becoming major galleries in New York and be their West Coast representative. Is that, well, is that an accurate? Well, I don't know whether I got it right. I, want, I wanted to bring, like Irving, the, well, what I thought the best New York people were here and give them shows. Right. And then I wanted my people uh, to get shows in New York enough, and I did get shows. Beasley and George Jacobs. I got her two shows in New York and Green Gallery. I remember. And one. I was able to get uh, East Coast shows for, for the people I, I like. Uh, and I was also able to bring. Hey, Stanley. I'm sorry. Hey. We've been talking hey. about you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Everett Ellis. Ever, yeah. Hi, Stanley. Pleasure. 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 I'm sorry about your wife. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would anybody like a bathroom or a break or now? Or should we just keep going? I guess we leave that. Good. All right. Your turn. Your turn's coming around. Okay. So, I think you miss a really important part. I want to finish. I want to finish. I want to finish it. I want to finish my thing about the finance anyway. And so there was that form of, of financing, but we had two objectives. I wanted to get my good people to New York and place. I wanted to bring uh, the better New York people who were accessible to California. To California. Right. I mean, it was a, a, as simple as all that. Well, and I'll then go, I also I'll, wanted... I'll go a few international people, because you brought in Tingley and other people yeah, we've never yeah, seen before. That's right. I brought some, I brought some uh, overseas of people. Also David Smith as well. well. David Smith, David Smith, uh, I was, uh, 
his dealer for a period of friendship company. Yeah. And I sold more of his work in that show than he had sold on all of his life in dollars. So David, okay. David was uh, uh, very loyal to me and, and uh, Hi. Sent, sent me that show. Yeah. But, uh, that's all. But then I also... Uh, but that was brilliant. I remember it. It was just astonishing. That show? I yeah. Mean, it was a beauty, it? Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I wrote a little catalog introduction to that yeah. show. And uh, one day I get a call from Frank O'Hara who's looking for stuff for that show we worked on at uh, Noma. Yeah. And uh, he called me and he, and he wanted to put my David Smith uh, correspondence in the Archives of American Art, which he did. And then he said, Every, that catalog introduction you wrote in that catalog was the best piece I've ever read about David Smith. Whoa. Well, that's coming, cool. coming from Frank O'Hara. <laughs> coming from Frank O'Hara. Yeah. 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 But he's anyway, a friend of mine too. He's a nice guy. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway. I wonder if you ever heard the story of uh, when the LA County Museum was being built. Yes. And Jim Elliott came to see me mm -hmm. and said, we've, we've got, I think, a problem. And I said, what's your problem, Jim? And he said, there are these two ponds. In, they're filled in now, yeah. in front of the museum. And I want to do something, and I'm not sure what to do. And I said, David Smith. And he said, well, what do I do? I said, write to David Smith. And he wrote to David Smith, asking for a sculpture. And David Smith said, send me the plans. And Jim Elliott sent David Smith the plans of the LA County Museum, including those two ponds. And Smith wrote back and said, I will lend you six cubi. Lend, wow. you. lend you six cubi, three for one pond, three for the others. I think that would be appropriate. And he loaned six cubi. And you've never seen anything like it, Stanley. Yeah. But what it did, most of all, is it took the curse off the building. <laughs> you couldn't see some of it. These were so uh, brilliant. Brilliant in every way. I mean, dazzling to look at. Brilliant in execution. They were so sublime. You couldn't see anything else. All you, all you saw were the six. Show came down. Everett, I met him at a restaurant or something. I said, what are you going to do about the Cuba? He said, send them back. I said, you've got to keep them. You've got to keep them. Call David, get a price on six. He called David, he got a price on six. Half a million. Yeah. Half a million for six. For six. Couldn't, uh, raise, but couldn't uh, raise it. Couldn't raise it. No, we raise it. Couldn't, that was later. Yeah. later. Couldn't later. raise it. Couldn't raise it, sent the six yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Another. Missed opportunity. Yeah, so, <laughs> so well, but but listen, Patty had something that she wanted to. Introduce. Yeah, you were saying well, that. One thing that I don't a... think that any of you are bringing up. Yes. Though I'm sure you all know about it, there is and always has been a definite inferiority complex on the part of Los Angeles people. Yeah. And in particular. Anything that comes from New York, they want to buy in New York. They want to buy yeah. in New York. In New York. Yeah. Yeah. And when we, when the, that was one of the things that Betty and I did when we opened the gallery, <coughs> is that we decided, uh, it was actually, it was my idea. Right. I decided with Nick's help, Nick Wilder, uh, <coughs> that I would go to dealers in New York ask them for specific exhibitions and invite them to come out with the exhibition because I've witnessed over and over again people going to Corcoran and looking yeah. at a de Gunin yeah. show yeah. and then coming over to where yeah. I was yeah. and saying uh, we want a, a de Kooning more than anything. Yeah. But we have to go to New York. Have to go to New York. To well, yeah. well, 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 well that was the big problem there, and you talk about the inferiority complex, and it's absolutely true. The feeling was that New York dealers would not send A plus work yeah. to a Los Angeles. Right. That's that's right. That was the feeling. That's that's right. Right. Now, but just a minute. That's and right. uh, again, to, to bring up Virginia, when she showed the Rauschenberg show, uh, those pieces were absolutely in every way superb, as was the yeah. Gustin show, as was yeah. the East Klein show. But people in Los Angeles still went to New York know. to be That's right. You know, but, if I, uh, that persists, I think, to this day. Well, to a certain extent. To this day, yeah. Yeah. yes, it still exists. It still exists. Irving and Ellen went to New York. Yeah. Deborah went 
Yeah. yeah. The, reason, <laughs> the reason why I closed, why I, why I uh, closed my second gallery uh, really was when I had the Marlboro offer. You know, I was really tired of spending all this time with with the good good collectors, connoisseurship training, chatting, finding things. They always went to New York and bought it there. And I said, you know, after all I've done running a museum scale operation here with my own capital, you'd think that one of them might think about, let, let Everett get me one from Sydney Janice. I could have walked out with Sydney or Leo's with a better picture than they can walk in and buy. And I said, I can't do that anymore. I can't run a privately sponsored small spiffy museum anymore. But ever you know, that like, just get back to it. That was you your model. Are you feeling, Irving? Yeah. You're well, I mean, uh, um, I was thinking of the single reason I left California. I left California for a number of reasons. I was curious about New York, about doing a gallery back there. Um, after all, it's where the center has always been.